So tonight's lecture is going to cover a second set of path models. And I kind of like to spend a lot of time on path models only because, you know, this is the first model you've built. And so getting a real good handle on um, degrees of freedom, identification, how to write some of this code will help you move into the more complex, and use this word loosely, models. Because I think CFA models are, are pretty simple. We can start with some simple ones, but then we're going to slowly diversify your skill set so that you can do all types of models. And one thing we've covered briefly here and there is fit indices, and now we're really going to get into fit indices. Okay, so this is the alphabet soup lecture. There are going to be a lot of fit indices, and we're not even going to cover all of them. We're just going to cover kind of like a broad swath of them and talk about kind of the uses and misuses of fit indices. So now that we've looked at a couple of examples, how do we know if the model is any good? So does our model actually represent reality? Does it at least represent the data? <laughs> and so we've talked a little bit about how fit indices are a match between the covariance matrix from the model and the covariance matrix from the data. And I'm going to slowly kind of prove that to you <laughs> as the weeks go on. So next week I'll show you an example of how you can look at the reproduced uh, covariance matrix from your model. And we're going to slow get into, like, get deeper into looking at all of the paths and examining the fit. So we're kind of grabbing bits and pieces right now so that once we get into these more complex models, you have the full array to really dig into the, the summary output. I don't know why dig into is my phrase for tonight, but here we go. So what we're going to do is use fit indices to determine if the model represents the data. Because just like in EFA, you can have models that have good parameter estimates. They look like they're, they're in the right direction. The, the standard errors look okay. They are the right size, if we're thinking about um, a factor analysis model. But still have a poor fitting model, because you're not actually capturing the variance that's in the data. So there's always this separation between the estimates themselves and the fit of the model. And so it's not like if we have good estimates, we have good fit. Um, in regression, uh, the same thing happens, right? You can have a significant predictor and only have a small, um, a small R squared, right? So generally, significant predictors lead to significant overall regression models if we use p-values this way. But uh, we might argue that we want a practically important model. So I can have predictors that appear useful, but once I look at the effect size, they're not. And so that's the same distinction here. Now I will tell you there are a lot of them. There's like a long running joke with some folks about um, how quickly these things are invented. So there's that like when a bell rings, an angel gets its wings kind of joke about when the bell tolls, there's a new fit in to see. There's just so many. And also there's a lot of papers that spend time arguing over the mathematical properties of these things and which one's best. But I'm going to give you the ones that I see the most that I think are probably the most well established and also point you point out some that are we know are not very good. And the rest is kind of up to your field. Um, they don't tell you that you're right or wrong they just tell you about the fit so you can kind of think of them like effect sizes where you want the effect size to be very very good right uh, much like uh, precision accuracy and recall in machine learning don't really tell you if you're right or wrong they just tell you how accurate that test set is right? um, and they have guidelines or rules of thumb much like our significance rules but those aren't perfect either, so people make entire careers out of arguing over these things. So I'll give you those guidelines because I think that they're helpful to know what other people will judge you your models on and to kind of get a feel for um, these as we get started. And people totally misuse them, just like they used to use every statistic. If it is a number, we can make it bend to our will, you know? So. Um, there is a bad tendency to cherry pick fit indices, meaning that um, you find the ones that support 
what you're doing and you ignore the rest. And the way I have always approached this is that I tend to use the same four every single time. If they're good or if they're bad, here are my four that I always use. And so my general suggestion to folks is to present an array of them. So more than one. We're not going to base everything on a single p-value here. We're going to base things on um, an array of fit indices. So some limitations of fit statistics is that they indicate like an overall fit to your model. They don't indicate which, if there's a problem with them, they don't tell you where that problem is, although there are other ways to look for this. Um, so there might be bad sections of a model where, especially a big complex model, but the overall fit to that model is okay. And that doesn't tend to happen that distinctly, right? But we can have sections of a model which are predictive, but still have good fit. Okay. And so you have to look at both sides. This is the important part here. It's not a magical number or summary, although people treat them this way. Um, and I guess, in a sense, I can be guilty as well when I do reviews for research papers. You know, I'll look at people and they're saying, this model's really good, and then, then the number is really not good. <laughs> so I'm like, I don't know where you're getting this thought process from, but we do have to remember that they're just a point estimate to an overall model fit. And they don't tell you if you've misspecified something. So even with, um, even if you don't have any errors in your model, there might be pieces of the model that are not representative of reality. But if the fit indice is bad, it doesn't really tell you where it is. Okay, you have to figure that out yourself. And they also don't tell you the predictive value of a model, okay, which is really important in a business sense. Right? And then that's where we get into um, you know, cross-validation or looking at the um, squared multiple correlations, the R-squared values, or using the model to predict something else. And so that predictiveness, the usefulness of a model, is always some other type of analysis. Okay, build the model, see if it works and then see if it works again, right? And then for me, as a, as a basic level researcher often, it doesn't tell me if it's theoretically meaningful. Okay, so I can't look at a fit agency like the RIMC that we've talked about before and go, oh, 0.02, this model is so important. And you can go, huh, well, they built a model to fit the data. Does, does that match reality? I have to find other ways to support that. And generally, the last two points are solved by, by replication, okay, seeing the same model over and over again. Like this model fits on this data set and this data set for this group and these people. And so it starts to solidify. So, you know, and that's true of all research. Like models that replicate tend to mean something different than models that don't predict multiple data sets, right? They don't generalize. I'm not saying that those are good models because I can probably... Um, create some something <laughs> that replicates many times but doesn't mean anything, right? So. All right, so let me give you the rules here. Okay. And so the rules come from this 1999 um, simulation paper by Hugh and Bentler. Now, Bentler is a name you'll see many times uh, throughout this lecture. He was a prominent figure in structural equation modeling um, that is still cited today. This is a very popular paper for the golden rules. Okay. And they represent the same kind of problem that we see when people talk about statistical significance. Like if it's less than 0.05, it somehow becomes magic. If it's 0.051, it's somehow a loser, right? Like there, we, anytime we're dichotomizing continuous variables, we have to be real careful. And effect sizes. Like Cohen, I think at one point in his life said that um, he regretted telling people these effect size rules because now everyone uses them and abuses them. And so you have to remember that these are continuous uh, measures. And so the, the, them being you know, 0.01 on the good side does not make it really that different from 0.01 on the bad side. But what are the rules? So they fall into two categories. Our goodness of fit statistics, okay, where we want values close to 1. These represent a match between the covariance matrix of the data and the covariance matrix of the model. And so we've kind of come up with these rules that they're excellent if they're above 0.95 and good if they're above 
On the flip side, we have badness of fit statistics, where we want values that are close to zero. And this represents the mismatch of the residuals between those two covariance matrices. And I've seen excellent as 0.06 and 0.05. I'm just going to stick with 0.06 because that's what I remember, but it could be 0.05. Good as 0.08 and acceptable as 0.10. So you notice they're kind of opposites of each other because of the, the different ways that they're calculated. So we'll start with the model test statistic, which is kind of the um, general model overall um, measure that many fit statistics are based on. So it's something you have to understand first. And then we'll talk about the diversity of the types of fit statistics. And I'll try to tell you if it's a goodness of fit or badness of fit. Okay. So the model test statistic is chi-square. You will see it printed in the output as labeled as model test statistic. And what it does is it examines the reproduced correlation matrix. I, correlation, covariance, same thing here, but what does that mean, reproduced? Okay, so it takes, <clears throat> excuse me, the model that you've built, given, and then uh, giving, no, given the path coefficients and everything, and reproduces what it expects the covariance or correlation matrix to be, you know, given the model. Okay. Then it takes the actual variance from the data just see how much they match. Well, chi-square is, is a residual statistic in its all of its different forms, and so chi-square distribution tends to be, um, you know, hovers around over zero and one, kind of like F distribution, where the uh, many of the null values, no difference between whatevers, uh, are close to zero. So the residuals are very small. The difference between these two matrices are small. And so that sum can get very large. So chi-square is kind of an unbounded statistic in the sense that it can be infinitely large, but it's never negative because it's squared. Okay. So we're basically taking the, dis the difference between those two models, squaring them, divided by what we might expect. Okay. Give you a very brief summary of chi-square. Now, this is a badness of fit statistic, and so we want it to be very close to zero. However, since it is not forced and uh, standardized, normalized, I think it's a better word here, where, you know, chi-square could be 700, it doesn't follow those same badness of st fit statistic rules. So it's not one of the ones that fits under less than 0.08, because that would be a very unusual model. So chi-squares compared to its chi-square distribution. And so we want this value to be small because it measures that mismatch or error. And what we do to chi-square, what people used to do as a preview for the next couple of slides, is treat this in a null hypothesis context, okay, which is wildly problematic. Okay. And so the traditional kind of blended null hypothesis, so if you like super nerdy things, there's a really like short, fun little book on uh, null hypothesis testing as we know it, which is actually a blend of two different types of statistical thinking into the kind of weird mishmash that we use today. But the type of thing that you would have learned in, in our coursework, right, that most people teach, is this idea of a rejected support context. Okay. So I have um, let's say two groups that I wanted to compare and my null hypothesis is that nothing happened in my experiment and those two groups are equal. My alternative or research hypothesis is often that there's some sort of difference between them. My manipulation worked or these groups are somehow different. And then we compile the evidence and we see if we have enough evidence to reject the null. So I can reject the, the idea that nothing happened, therefore supporting the idea that something happened. Okay, so I reject the null to support the research. I never accept the research, I never accept the null. So there's never this like proving of the null, proving of the research, because this is not math, right? <clears throat> but what we do is we reject the null, support the research. And so people treat, um, treat, stem testing as kind of a way to uh, support the null, which is not how this stuff works. Okay. 
So generally we reject the null saying it's very unlikely. The probability of the null is very low, so our p-value is small. Okay. And so the research hypothesis is likely because the null is not likely. Okay. Here in sim models, what we want to do is support the model that represents the data. Okay. And so we're trying to say that these things match, that they're not different, which is the null hypothesis. And there are ways to predict the null, often in Bayesian contexts or um, some kind of newer tests of one-sided effects. But um, here, people are like, oh, well, we just want it to be non-significant because that means that the null is true or the null is supported, which is not how this works. So it's a, it's a really an odd use of chi-square to say that, well, the chi-square was non-significant so there's no evidence to reject the null, so we support the null. So a lot of people say, well, you shouldn't use chi-square in this way at all. And so maybe we shouldn't use this as our um, measure of model fit. So that's the first big problem with chi-square. Okay. The way that chi-square is calculated is the second big problem. Okay. So the formula for it is n minus 1, and this is n sample size. So sample size, remember, does not play into degrees of freedom. However, it does play into the test statistic. And so you multiply the sample size times the fit, minimum fit function, which just every time I see it makes me laugh uh, because it's FML, which is kind of a fun newer acronym. But some people just label this as F. Um, but we're using maximum likelihood, so uh, we're going to multiply that by sample size. Now, we've already said that structural equation models need large samples. And so the larger the sample, the larger this number can naturally get because of this multiplication. So we're kind of screwing ourselves, in a sense, by saying, well, we need it to be non-significant. But I'm going to multiply it by sample size, and you have to have a large sample size. And so it's a catch-22 meaning it's kind of almost impossible to meet, and we shouldn't use it this p-value criterion this way anyway. Now, the p-values are based on the degrees of freedom from the model, not the degree, not like n minus 1, okay, and that chi-square distribution. So if you have one degree of freedom, your chi-square value can only be 3.84 or less to be, I guess it has to be 3.85, because 3.84 is the cutoff. Uh, that's really tricky because, I thought I had it on this slide, um, when you're multiplying by n and you have to have 200, 10,000 people, you know, like 200 is kind of a minimum. You can have, I have had models of 13,000 or more. Uh, Chi-square can get very big very fast. And so it's almost an impossible situation. And so like, what I'm saying, going to say here is it's biased by a lot of things, sample size being the biggest one. But what else is it biased by? Okay. Any kind of multivariate non-normality. Okay. Whereas maximum likelihood handles non-normality pretty well, and um, so skewed data, right? It also, uh, the sample sizes that we use tend to kind of create robust um, models because the central limit theorem and the law of large numbers and all those kinds of mathematical things that um, kind of help us out when we have big data, uh, big sample sizes. Um, let's say you have a really large correlation between items. This can break your model, but it's also really hard to estimate because you're trying to predict the very top of the distribution. Any type of unique or error variance. And sample size, I have like, this is the big one next to it. So the larger the sample, the larger chi-square is, just because of the formula, okay, and more. So people report chi-square. If you ever have to write like a fancy report or you're doing like a, you know, an, an academic paper, people report chi-square. And then just everybody ignores it. It's like one of these weird things that like it's a requirement. I got to report it. <laughs> Nobody uses it unless it's favorable to them. And then that's why I say people misuse them. So in general, the chi-square is a value that you really shouldn't use to represent model fit, but you might see it reported in places. For a long time, there was a suggestion to use what was called normed chi-square. This is still in most of the, the textbooks. Um, 
where you divide chi-square by the degrees of freedom and there were some rules on what was a good model versus not. And I have published this kind of stuff before I realized um, and read a paper that was published before I was born, so I should have known better, uh, that that statistic is just as problematic. And so there are a couple of citations that go over how that is just as full of issues as chi-square itself. And so you should just like leave chi-square out of it. Except, you'll see here in a minute, that chi-square is used to calculate these other statistics. So we haven't really gotten rid of chi-square, but we've found ways to normalize it. And then use those as the, the measure of our fit. Okay. So chi-square has these sort of known issues, how can we fix it? Now one thing I can do is use what's called the robust estimator. Okay. And this is the Sotora Bentler, or the Ewan Bentler. So you see Bentlers come up again. And I think, if I remember correctly, that Levon automatically gives you the bias corrected one, the Satora bin. That still doesn't really solve our problem, but it is helpful if we want to fix some of the bias that's known. Instead, what we can do is use a whole different set of fit indices. Okay? And there, uh, to understand what's happening in these, we kind of have to explain um, the hypothesis testing that's built into this. Okay. So there are three types of models. Your model, a model of independence, and this model assumes that there's no relationships between the variables, that the parameters are not significant, their, their uh, values are zero. And so it gives you some degrees of freedom back because there's no point in estimating that parameter because it shouldn't exist. Okay. Or what's called a saturated model, that assumes that all parameters exist where degrees of freedom is zero. Okay. So they exist and they get estimated. It doesn't say anything really about how good they are. Okay. Sometimes you'll see the independence model called the baseline model, and that's what's printed in Levon. It'll say baseline model. Um, but depending on which fit indice you're using, they might compare your model to an independence model, which is kind of a good... Um, null model, right? The, none of this works. Right? Or a saturated model. You know, so most of the ones we're going to talk about compare your model to in, uh, the independence model, so it'll say baseline in many of these formulas here. And so what we can do is start to do ratios. So the next whole section, <laughs> until the end, is about different ways to create a normalizing ratio to make it either be a goodness of fit statistic, which ranges from zero to one, where one is good, or a badness of fit statistic, which ranges from zero to one, where zero is good. And these are a little less black and white, like they're continuous, um, but then we have rules for them where we force them into these categories. And then last, it's easy to cherry pick. So to pick only the ones that support your model because, I mean, Levon is just a program. It'll print them all out for you and you can just pick the ones that look good. Okay. Try not to do that. Try to take in that information that the model fit is not good. All right, so there's a couple categories. We're going to do four of them. So absolute fit indices, incremental fit indices, parsimony adjusted fit indices, and predictive fit indices. So we'll walk through these and the different alphabets that fall underneath them. So absolute fit indices first. And these are kind of the simplest solution to normalizing chi-square. And so it's the proportion of the covariance matrix explained by the model. So it's essentially a measure of, of model fit, just like linear models. So it's kind of a, a form of R squared. Many of these are different forms of R squared. Okay. And we want these values to be high. Okay. Now there's three main ones. The goodness of fit indice, adjusted goodness of fit index, the parsimonious goodness of fit index. I put them all on one slide because they're all terrible. Okay. And what they used to use is this sort of formula, one minus v residual over v total, where residual is the v residual is the variance not explained by the model, and total is the total amount of variance. So that should look a lot like r squared. Right. So if the residual is zero, this fit indice comes up as one, because right. you have basically explained all the variance. Right. 
Now, the research on these indicates that they pretty much always tell you that your model's great because of the way that the V residual part is calculated. Okay, and they're not really recommended for you. So when I see people use them, I'm always like, no, bad stuff, <laughs> bad dog. Um, so we shouldn't use a statistic that always tells us we're right. Okay, it makes it kind of hard to know when to fix the model. And I apologize for the terrible picture, but my latex skills kind of stop at one E value. <laughs> so um, I grabbed this from one of the publications on SRMR. Now we used a very similar statistic in our EFA lecture. We used the root mean squared residual. Okay, so not to be confused with RMSR. But this is the standardized root mean residual. And it's kind of a gross formula that uses both the variances here in the middle as a ratio to potential degrees of freedom. And so some of these, many of these statistics have penalties for complex models. So the more, oops, the more um, parameters that you could estimate, right, or parameters that you are estimating. So um, complex models, the idea kind of Occam's razor, the simplest solution is the most likely one. And so the more complex your model, the more it penalizes you. And so it makes your fit statistic look worse. So simple, sometimes um, the solution to good fit indices is to start deleting things <laughs> for these fit indices. So SRMR is a badness of fit index because it's a residual fit, so we want small values. And so the basic gist of that formula, you won't ever have to know this, is that is a ratio of the variance to the possible parameters, kind of standardized. So those are absolute fit indices. Some incremental fit indices, um, also known as comparative fit indices, are weighted so that it's zero to one, where we want high values. And so these are goodness of fit ones. And it's essentially a measurement of your model compared to that independence or baseline model. So this is why it's called an incremental fit index, because it's not absolute. It's not a measurement of the variance um, R squared, essentially, it's comparative. So our model is better than the independence model. So like in hierarchical regression, we add new parameters and different steps, and we see which model, you know, did this new step add something good? This is kind of what this does. So we want our model to be better than the baseline model, because that implies that adding all these estimated paths was good for the model. Now, if you, you can get negative values for these, okay, that just means that the model's really, really bad. Okay. And so uh, if you get a negative value um, for like things like uh, we're going to talk about the Tucker-Lewis index here, um, you haven't really mathematically done anything wrong. That just means that your model is like real bad. Okay. So the big one, which we've seen before, the comparative fit index is the most popular. Whoops. Got excited with my button pushing here. And that's a ratio of your chi-square model minus its degrees of freedom divided by the chi-square baseline minus its degrees of freedom. And so it's uh, a ratio, a comparison between either your model and the baseline model. So you want your model to be um, the chi-square to be smaller. This is kind of backwards, right? Because your chi-square fits the data better than the baseline model. So you want this whole ratio to basically be zero because then your comparative index would be um, one. And so the way that you get that is having a small numerator. Okay, so you want your chi-square model to be small okay, in comparison, especially to the baseline model. And that's a nice thing um, because the, the now we've kind of normalized out, so to speak, the influence of, of sample size. The chi-square of the baseline also includes that sample size. So we're kind of dividing sample size out of the equation. Okay. Now these can be influenced by sample size, but just not as much as chi-square. All right, there's the normed fin index, which is a variation of the uh, CFI, because the CFI tends to underestimate for small samples. And so it's 
a simpler model. It's a chi-square baseline divided by chi-square model. Okay, and this one's actually the other way around, or I have maybe flipped those by accident. I'll check that, make sure, because I think model should be on top. That would make more sense. Okay. So I've probably just accidentally done the wrong fraction here. So model to baseline, okay, just like up here. Uh, I just talked about my latex skills. <laughs> okay. There's also the incremental fit index, okay, which is known as Bowen's non-normed fit index. Okay. It's a modified version of the normed fit index okay, that decreases our emphasis on sample size. Okay. And so we get this kind of weirder subtraction where we have chi-square baseline minus chi-square model because the baseline chi-square should always be larger divided by the baseline minus the degrees of freedom. And so we're really taking sample size out of here twice now. That's what makes me think I have the other one backwards. The relative fit index is Boland's normed fit index. And so now you can start to understand what I mean by alphabet soup, right? And so in theory, we have two different NFIs and two different NNFIs. So they've kind of been given different names over the years, but sometimes it's difficult to know if people don't cite which one they're using. So I tend not to use the NFI ones because it's it, you don't know which one it is. Now you can tell people which one you're using, but that's not how researchers <laughs> tend to do this. They just say the NFI and I'm like, which one there's for? Okay. And it's a ratio of a ratio. So it's the chi-square model divided by degrees of freedom model divided by chi-square baseline, divided by degrees of freedom baseline. And this eventually, essentially reduces down to model divided by baseline. Okay. So you'll notice that it's a similar pattern across all of these. Okay. Now my favorite out of the incremental fit indices, other than the comparative fit index, is the Tucker-Lewis, which we used in EFA. So you'll see that my, my four that I always report are very similar to EFA. And this is the Bentler Bonnet non norm fit index. So it's also the NNFI, but check out here's Bentler again in our lecture. So I should have made it um, a, I hate to say a drinking game, <laughs> but a Bentler bingo, if you will. This is a very popular fit index. Okay. And it's just a slightly different form of the one we saw of, of the two different non normed fit indices ones we've already seen. So it incorporates both that fractions and the subtraction. <laughs> so we've got our baseline minus our model divided by baseline again, in a slightly different form. And this is why these all fit under incremental fit indices, because they're a ratio okay, of model to baseline. And so that's kind of the end of those. Now, parsimony-adjusted indices are models that include pen penalties for complexity. So models that have more parameters um, often result in better fit up to the point of overfitting. Okay, so overfitting occurs when you've just added a bunch of parameters to make your model fit better. Just like in regression, we can add a bunch of predictors just to make our model fit better. And so they tend to have, this whole set of fit indices, tend to have smaller values for simpler models, okay? all other things being equal, like all predictiveness being equal. And the best one that we pretty much everybody reports is the root mean squared error of approximation or the RIMC, which we used in EFA as well. And I would say in bold, this is the most popular one. If people are gonna report something it's usually the RIMC and the CFI. And we'll talk later in the semester about why the CFI is so popular, um, but definitely the RIMC. I don't think I've, I don't wanna say ever, but it's asymptoting at the likelihood being zero. <laughs> um, I don't think I've really ever seen a paper without the RIMC in it. The other ones come and go, but that one's the most popular. And generally, you also report the confidence interval. So I think a couple weeks ago, somebody asked about the confidence interval in the EFA output. You also see it in the uh, SAM output. Now, the formula for this one, you'll notice, is not the comparison. It's adjusted. So it actually does include sample size as well, but includes this penalty for 
um, more complex models. Right? And so you are, a, the, the more degrees of freedom you have, the more you're going to subtract it down to your chi-square. And we want chi-square to be small, right? This is a badness of fit statistic. I don't know if I have that on here. But as a badness of fit statistic, we want this number to be very small. And so if our degrees of freedom for our model is, is um, 1, okay, that chi-square reduction is not very much. But if our degrees of freedom model is 100, right, meaning we have a lot of degrees of freedom, um, then we'll be reducing more. Okay, so that's where the parsimony adjustment comes in. And then, unfortunately, it does include some sample size, but that's because we're essentially dividing the sample size out of the chi-square here. Uh, there are other parsimony adjustment ones, but mainly people use the RIMC. Excuse you. Are you done? All right. So our last category here is predictive fit indices. Now, I think this name is a bit of a misnomer because I, there's no... Predictive fit indices don't have rules. I mean, people have tried to make up rules for them, but I don't think there's any real good consensus here. And so they have the name that tells you, like, how useful the model should be in predicting, but I don't think they really do this very well. Okay. And the idea is that what they tell you <clears throat> is a in a hypothetical replication of this study with the same sample size in the same population, this is how good the model will be. Okay. Practically, I've never used them this way. I use them in a comparison sort of way. And so instead of thinking about this as fit, because I don't have any concept that the, the statistics are not normalized, right? they can be almost any infinite, infinite range of numbers, right? we can then use the these statistics to compare two models, which is kind of what the end of this lecture is going to cover as model comparison. Right? And sometimes people consider these parsimony adjusted indices. Right? I've separated them out myself because uh, with our absolute fit indices, our, our um, incremental fit indices, and parsimony adjusted indices, we can uh, have, we kind of have guidelines for those, and they're normalized to be mostly 0 to 1. These are not. So let's talk a little bit about model comparison before I tell you what those statistics are, and I have Butcher saying a couple of them. Um, so let's say you've built this model. You've gotten some, hey, go away. It's like having children who are small and furry and don't listen. <laughs> Let's say you've built this model. It's a beautiful model. And you want to adjust your beautiful model. Because you've realized, looking at your fitness, that the model's not very good. So let's make it better. Okay. What I can do is compare this adjusted model to my original model to see if that adjustment is better. So it's just kind of... Similar to hierarchical regression, I can compare those two models to see that that added parameter or subtracted parameter has made my model better. Cool. I want to compare my two different models. I have to consider a, an important factor, though. Okay. So I can compare my fit statistics directly, but the problem is there's no like real good rule for RIMC. Is 0.01 better? Okay, there are some rules for those. Actually, I like to you. Um, but it becomes tricky if the models are, you know, like how much better do I need to be? So enter two different ways to, to think about this. Okay. The first way is to, to determine if your models are what's called nested. And the idea behind a nested model is if I can take model one and create model two out of it, they're nested okay. by adding and subtracting a set of parameters. So a one-factor model and a two-factor model are nested together because you're essentially just splitting into making a separate factor. And so here's the technical formula. Model A is said to be nested within model B if model B is just a more complicated version of model A. In general, if you add new squares, okay, it doesn't tend to be nested. And so one-factor model is nested within a two-factor model because the one-factor model is a simpler version of a two-factor model where the correlation between those factors is actually one. 
And so what we can do if they're nested, and we'll talk about in a minute, how, there are ways to just ignore this question of if they're nested at all, is calculate a chi-square difference test. And this is similar-ish to what happens when you compare models. Um, let's say you run two regression models and you compare them against each other. Yeah, that one you get a, an F difference test. So is that F, you know, given your new degrees of freedom, is that uh, change in F value important? Okay. But we are basing everything on the model test statistic, which is why we started this lecture there. And so we're looking at the change in chi-square. And so if the change in chi-square is significant, the model with the lower chi-square should be better. Minus all the issues with significance here. Um, if you say no, you say the models are the same, you go with a simpler model. Um, because simpler models are always preferred in, in structural equation modeling. So I could do this manually. I just wanted to show you kind of how it works, but there's a function that does this much faster. So I could say, okay, what's the difference in chi-square? So I got one model with the chi-square is 12 and one model with the chi-square is four. So that seems like a pretty big difference, but I have to incorporate how many degrees of freedom I've added or subtracted. So by adding, or, you know, like if I make the model way more complex, the model will just fit better because it should. Okay, so adding parameters should make your model better. Um, so let's account for the fact that I added two to, I've subtracted two degrees of freedom. So I added two parameters. And then I calculated that on the difference. So about eight points with two degrees of freedom is a p-value of 0.016. Okay. So I would say, yeah, that's a significant difference between the two models. Now, you don't really want to do it this way because it's a little, it's not tedious, it's three lines of code, but, you know, there's a faster function to do this. It's um, the ANOVA function <laughs> in, in R, which amuses me to no end because it does not actually do an ANOVA. <laughs> it's a model comparison function, um, which is very confusing when you're teaching people R the first time. <laughs> but, so no, ANOVA is AOV. <laughs> ANOVA itself is a model comparison function anyway. Okay. Um, another thing we can do that we will use okay, later in the semester is the chi-square difference, I'm sorry, the CFI difference test where I subtract my CFI from model one, from model two, in whatever way the larger one first. Okay. If the change is more than 0.01, then the models are considered different and you pick the model with the larger one. And in theory, this version is not biased by sample size issues with chi-square. In practice, there's some disagreement on what the cutoff score should be. Should it be 0 0.005? Should it be 0 0.01? Should it be 0 0.007? We're going to stick with 0 0.01, uh, but do know that people argue over these things. Um, <clears throat> so we can do that subtraction and see. And when we get to the section where we're going to use that, uh, we'll look at some functions that kind of make this easier for us. But how do I even know what to change? Look, say I'm looking at this model, and I've had this thought in my head, this theory, and here's the model that just doesn't work. Like, what do I, how do I know what to do? Well, hopefully you have some ideas based on why you built the model, but, you know, if you're working on your homework, first rule of thumb is always change one thing at a time because it affects all the other parameters. But there's a really cool function called modification indices where it looks at potential things that you could add to your model and tells you how much it would improve your model. So basically tests every possible parameter that you could add and you can look at them and sort them and say, well, this one makes sense. Let me try adding that one. And it, say, and it does this by looking at the chi-square change value. So essentially it looks for all the chi-squares that are based on the Lagrange multiplier, um, where chi-square is one degree freedom. This is why I change one thing at a time. And says, okay, anything over 3.84 is significant with P less than 0.05. And so here's all the ones that are possible. And there's a function in Levon that'll print all these out for you, and you can sort them so you can see the best ones first. 
And what it really tells you is where the misfit in the model occurs and misspecification. So the fit and C doesn't tell me that, but I, like I said, there are ways that I can look up where the model isn't working. Sometimes it's illogical, right? We get a, a modification to see that would make no sense to add, um, but sometimes they're really obvious. And next week we'll cover some reasons why they might be obvious. So instead of doing all this math, I can use the ANOVA function. And so we do something like ANOVA model1.fit, uh, model2.fit, and it will print out a table for us. It's really nice. Now, there is some confusion often if the models are nested or not. And so if they're not nested, or if they are, who cares, you can always use the next set of fit indices we're going to cover here, because it doesn't matter if they're nested or not. So I really like these because it doesn't make require me to think about <laughs> the rules for nested models. Okay, here we go. The Akaki, it's my best guess. Information criterion, every time I see it, my brain like does a small freeze. <laughs> okay. um, or AIC, the Bayesian information criterion, or BIC. Okay. Or the sample size adjusted information criterion, or SABIC. Okay. Now, Notice that these say information criterion with them. Okay. So they're a completely different form of math. And on their own, they're not interpretable. Okay. So if you told me my AIC was 7,000, I'd be like, great. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> because they're not really a ratio. They're not normalized. They're just numbers. Okay. They're more than just numbers, but they don't have, they're like log likelihood criterions, right? On their own, they're maybe not super interpretable. And all of these are parsimony adjusted, meaning they penalize you for having more complex models. All other things are equal. We want to bias towards a simple model. And so if you, you know, if you run these simulation studies and you can make all other things equal, um, simpler models will have lower AIC values. And what we do is we compare them and we just pick the one with the lower value, always lower, even when negative. So the values that are always smaller, not closer to zero, but always smaller. Okay. So if you have negative 5,000 and negative 5,005, negative 5,005 is smaller. Okay. If we can remember some <laughs> basic math, I'm telling you, as a like grown researcher, I was always like, but, but is that number smaller? <laughs> so we want values that are not like absolute value smaller. We want just literal smaller. Okay. I'm projecting here. Another popular one that works in the same way is what's called the expected cross-validation index. Because in theory, these are predictive fit models, so it's telling you how much it expects to cross-validate. But people tend to use them in a model comparison way. But here's the formula. I can't show you the formula for AIC because it takes up three pages. But um, for ECVI, it's that fit statistic for our maximum likelihood estimation. Plus 2 times t where t is the number of parameters estimated, divided by sample size minus the number of squares, our measured variables, minus 2. And that formula is very reminiscent of some formulas for um, of um, outlier statistics, like Cook's and leverage values. Okay. And so it kind of tries to, you know, encapsulate like how how much I might expect that next fit index to be and we want our fit indices our, our fit statistic function to be very low so you want these numbers to be small okay. and essentially it's kind of almost providing not a confidence interval but kind of like a expected next value and so we want to pick the one with the smallest value and this is really useful if the models are not nested because it does not require them to have the same kind of structure. And one of them could have um, 80 more parameters, which would be crazy, but it could. So what do I do? I've just told you there's like 6,000 different fit indices. Like, what do I do? I am going to suggest that we use minimally RIMC, SRMR, and CFI. I also report when I do these the TLI. RIMC and CFI for sure, because we're going to use those in ways um, to do model comparison. 
And SRMR also just tends to give me a, a good view of another residual statistic. And so if I use all four, I've got two residual statistics that I want to be small and two goodness of fit statistics that I want to be large, including the TLI. Okay. Um, but I would say reporting wise, this is kind of usually the minimum. Okay. Um, generally, people also write down chi square and degrees of freedom. Okay. And the only reason that I like still kind of push this is because you can tell when I'm when, it, when you're looking at a paper, if you're kind of have learned these degrees of freedom rules, you can usually tell when they've done something wildly wrong because it is easy to write the code for these models. Okay. And then there are, um, like even in other programs like M plus, you know, you can cut and paste the code, but that does not mean that you know what the code from Stack Overflow does, right? Guilty. Um, and so sometimes people report things and you're just like, do what now? <laughs> Uh, so I'm hoping that by the time we've gone over degrees of freedom a couple of times in, in path models and, and talking about identification, you might sort of get this idea that you could, with some effort, do what's called tracing, where you look at what someone else has purported to do and say, you know what, your degrees of freedom don't make any sense here. Okay, I don't know what you've done, code in the background, but this is not what you're reporting which I've done on several um, reviews for these kinds of models. And then, oh yeah, by the way, we didn't use maximum likelihood. I'm like, well, that would have been helpful to report up front. Okay, because other, um, I will say that this set of fit indices kind of assumes maximum likelihood because other models will still use the same fit indices but have very different degrees of freedom rules. So when we get to item response theory, we'll talk about that more later. Oops, wrong side. Um, so, if you're going to talk about model change, use the right model comparison statistic or always use AIC and ECVI. You just can't go wrong with those. And um, let's do one more path example, but this time do it as a comparison. So, I'm just, this is just some, like, fa uh, some more um, fake data from a book. Okay. Well, it might not be fake, but some more data from one of our books where we're importing the correlation matrix. Okay. Now remember, generally you want your data to be unstandardized, and next week we'll go over how you can convert a correlation matrix into a covariance matrix if you have the right type of information. But if all, like, if you have the raw data, use the raw data, but for class purposes, sometimes it's a little easier because I have these examples. Um, and you'll see these examples in the book chapters that are posted online. Um, so for our comparison data here, we have um, morale, illness, neuroticism, relationships, and socioeconomic status. And we're going to build two models. So we're going to say illness is predicted by morale. So getting back to our understanding our uh, building blocks here. Relationship is predicted by morale, and morale is uh, predicted by socioeconomic status and neuroticism. Okay, so we've got kind of like a little triangle-y kind of model, where socioeconomic status leads to morale, which leads to relationships and illness. And then in our second model, we've kind of reordered these, okay, where socioeconomic status is actually predicted by illness and neuroticism. Morale is predicted again by oh, socioeconomic status and illness. So we've kind of like totally reordered these. And our relationship variable is predicted by morale and neuroticism. Okay. So just as an example, like these are the same variables, but two pretty different models. Okay. We could analyze those models. Okay. And so re remember that if you have a covariance or a correlation matrix, it's okay here, but you have to have the number of observations. Um, and, you know, I've lost a train of thought. Where was that going? Model one here. If we, I, I have had examples where I've made these up. <laughs> and sometimes if you put in the wrong number of observations, it like goes bonk. It does not work. But that's a different story um, to which I use for my advantage later. So I could show you guys what happens when it goes wrong. All right. 
Let's also summarize this model. So we're going to summarize the model fit using our, our big three normal um, pieces for the summary. Well, let's scroll, scroll, scroll. So now let's talk a little bit about what we see. So the model test, the user model. So with four degrees of freedom, we have um, a chi-square that's, that's significant. So there's you know, kind of nothing I can do here about this being not significant. But here's that baseline model. So this is a model where none of the relationships exist. So it gives us uh, nine degrees of freedom. And we can see in a ratio that our model is much better than baseline because remember the value should get close to zero. So this is the independence model. Uh, so the user model versus the baseline model. Okay, this is where the CFI and TL, TL, TLI pop up. Okay. The CFI is always slightly larger than the TLI, just mathematic, mathematically. Okay. And our CFI here would represent an acceptable model, okay. or TLI would not. Okay. This is why it's easy to cherry pick indices. I could just never tell you what the TLI is. And you'd be like, oh, this is a good model. It does give me AIC, BIC, and um, the sample size BIC, but on their own, they're, I, you know, I don't know what this means. Now let's come down a little bit more. So the big four that I always report are also shown here directly, um, and so there, you know, um, Levon is written by psychologists and or math mathy psych people. Um, so it's not too surprising that the four that they've put up here are the four that psychologists tend to report because, you know, um, and that's also what you tend to see in psych, also written by a psychologist. Uh, so that is just kind of why that's happened. I don't report these because these are the ones that are printed at the top. It's because these are the ones that are most commonly reported. So they're in this output, right? Uh, but our SRMR says that this is probably a good or excellent model, but our rim C does not. And this almost, I would say like, it's very common. We have two that are good and two that are not. So I'm going to represent, I'm going to tell you here all four and you can make your own, make up your own mind. This probably means that the model is somewhere in the middle. So it's not a terrible model, but it's not particularly a great model either. All right. Then we get all of our parameter estimates, which this is kind of a made-up model, so we're not really going to spend a whole lot of time looking at these and interpreting them. Um, but do notice that since we entered a correlation matrix, okay, um, that estimate is the same as all the standardized estimates. Okay, we'll talk about this more next week. But if you enter standardized data, you're only going to see one um, solution because the data has already been standardized. But we would want to look like, I mean, this um, covariance relationship is basically zero. But we would want to look here and just make sure that none of our variances are negative and none of our R squares are negative or over one. And then our standard errors aren't wild. Okay. And they're not. They're all about the same. Okay, so that's model one. What about model two? Okay. Same code. Look at model two. So we have one less degree of freedom. But notice that model two here has a much lower test, test statistic. So I'm already kind of leaning towards model two. Okay, can you tell this data is made up? <laughs> All right, let's go down a little bit more. Our CFI and TLI are both, you know, hitting the top here. I can compare AICs between models, which I'll do in just a second. But our RIMC is also very good. And our SRMR is good. And I would say that models tend to fit, for me, in my experience, three categories. They're awful, everything is bad, nothing has fit well, life is sad. They're a mixed bag, some good, some bad, don't know what to do, or they're all freaking great. Okay. And this is kind of how these models tend to go. And the worst ones to me are the ones in the middle, because you don't quite know what to do. Can I add some improvement? We'll talk about how to do that. Can I kind of find where the misfit is? What 
why am I getting these slightly different answers? Will this replicate, right? If they're really bad, it's super easy to just toss them. <laughs> and if they're really good, you're, yay, you win, okay. So, um, but that's because the data was made up to fit this model. Okay. Now, don't be afraid of negative estimates. Okay, negative estimates are okay. That just means the relationship is negative, like a negative correlation. Okay, negative variances are bad. Okay. And these are fine. So real quick, I'm going to print these out and look, just kind of show you what they look like. Okay, so this is model one, where we're trying to basically predict morale. Okay. And then this is model two. We're still trying to predict morale, but we've got to come up with a more complex relationship here. Just to kind of remind you how to print them out. And then we'll add some more cool stuff next week on how to make these charts even more fun. Now the real thing here is let's compare models. So if the models are nested, which they include the exact same um, measured variables, and so I think model two is kind of a more complex version of model one. Maybe not, maybe so. Kind of depends on how you feel about um, the requirement that many of the prediction paths be exactly the same, okay, the direction of the prediction. You know, mathematically, I can use this as a comparison. It's going to subtract the chi-squares, and it's going to tell me that that is significantly different. Okay. So I would pick um, model 2 because it has the smaller chi-square. A nice part of the ANOVA function is actually presents AIC and BIC right here next to each other. Um, and so we pick the smaller AIC which is still model two. If I wanted the ECVI, um, what I could do is use this fit measures function. Okay. Now, if you use fit measures without the second argument here, and by second argument, I mean you can leave this part totally out. Take the comma and took it out. If you do that, it will print them all for you, and we'll look at those next week. And you can see that there are even more than the ones we covered in this lecture. There are so many. <laughs> But if you just want to print a couple of them out, I can say, okay, you know what, give me the AIC and the ECVI, and then I can print those directly. And so I can say, okay, here's model one, here's model two. They're both lower, so model two is better. And so that's, a, that's how we start to create multiple models and compare them to each other. I will tell you, I love the ANOVA function. It will always put the smaller value on top. So even though I did one, two, I think it just kind of orders them so the subtraction mathematically is positive. So in summary here, what have we learned? Some basic model syntax from last week to this week, right? So we learned how to do the tildes. We've done the analyze, the, the, the build, analyze, and summarize steps, as well as diagram. So the four big steps, build, analyze, summarize, diagram. I always do those four. You might also have compare, which is the last thing that we went over. Okay, it's comparison between models. Um, last week we also talked about estimation, maximum likelihood versus some other options. We're mostly going to focus this semester on maximum likelihood. Um, and then a whole bunch of fit indices today, all of the fit indices today. And I think it's important to talk about how there are so many, but then everybody tends to kind of bias towards these stable, well-known statistics because I know if I'm looking at REMC from your model, as long as you've done it correctly, which is a questionable assumption sometimes, um, I know what that value should represent. Okay. If you show me the GFI, the goodness of fit index, I know that that value is useless. So, I've kind of given you, like, here's a whole bunch of them, but here are the ones people tend to use because they have these sort of known properties. Okay. All right, so that's fit indices, and that wraps up path analysis. And so next week we'll cover confirmatory factor analysis, or we'll get into using latent variables and how to build those types of models, which are considered measurement models.